It is the annual reorganizational meeting of the White River Valley Supervisory Union Full Board. So I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6.04. Um, and I'm going to have a suggestion for an adjustment to the agenda, but does anyone else have any suggested adjustments? We're still good. Okay. I believe, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, we're good. Okay. Um, all right. So my suggested adjustment is going to be since we have uh, two uh, White River Valley High School graduates here tonight to present a celebration on learning on pathways, that we would move that underneath right after 4.1 to 4.2 to let them do their presentation. And then we could complete the rest of our board reorg and not have to have them sit through that. Are there any objections to that suggested adjustment? They're not enthusiastic about seeing how this level of local civic government works. Well, yeah, I'm so appreciative <laughs> that they graduated and we're willing to come back. Yeah, no, I'm very excited to hear what they have to say. <laughs> Uh, I like that. I like that recommendation. I can't wait to see their presentation. All right. Um, I don't think we need to assign a time or a timekeeper. So the next order of business would be to elect a chairperson. Do we have any nominations for chair for the White River Valley Supervisor Union full board? I nominate Kathy Galuzzo. I'll second. Thank you. Are there any other nominations? Move to close. All Second. right. That was seconded. We are now closed. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor of Kathy being the uh, board chair, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Kathy, you're not pope. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> all right, Kathy, thank you. It's all, right, all yours. Thank you for the nomination. So thanks for your support and you guys. I really appreciate you. Um, we are going to move on to the celebration of learning. Um so I if I could just introduce, I um had the opportunity of filling in at the White River Valley High School uh, as uh, principal for a few days. And so I had the pleasure while I was there to be able to see Lucas's uh, presentation on his senior um, pathway project where he demonstrated um, multiple proficiencies. Um, and then I was not able to see Maria's uh, actual presentation, but what I was able to do was sit down and hear about all the work that had gone into her presentation and learning experience leading up. So what I've asked is for Mr. Boyington, who's our pathways coordinator at the White River Valley High School, is to join these two students to really just provide a table talk and to give you some information about what their experience was via our pathways program and allow board members to ask questions to try to start to bring more of a narrative in these, these learning experiences that we're providing for students to life because as you know in, in our strategic plan the goal is to provide multiple pathways toward graduation across all of our member schools and to provide experiences like this through capstone projects starting in two years um, and so what you're hearing tonight is yes two graduates from the white river valley high school but i think it's going to give you some great um, examples and abilities to ask questions so that you can start to get a feel of what that might look like at, at the different levels of our organization, educationally. So, Mr. B, I'll hand it over to you and- Sure, sure. Um, trying to get into the frame here. Hi, um, Ben Boynton, Flexible you Pathways Coordinator. Um, I'm really not gonna say much, except that it was a real pleasure to work with these two young people in, in various ways in the last year, um, but it's really their show. So, um, I'm just thrilled that uh, Mr. Carney was able to attend at least one and to be in conversation with Maria and that, you know, glad that he was inviting us here tonight. So um, I'm going to turn it over to, to who wants to go first. I'll go first. Okay. So I'll let them tell their own stories because I don't, you know, it's it's all about them, right? So 
And for the board members virtually, if you're having a hard time hearing, let us know and we'll increase the volume. Meaning our graduates would talk louder. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lucas Turkey, and I'm a graduated senior from White River Valley High School. And I'm here to tell you about my experience in Flexible Pathways with Mr. Bullington. So this year I started off at Randolph Technical Career Center in the Construction Trades and Management Program. And my ideal goal was to work four days a week and be in the classroom one day. And when I got there, they first told me that that was going to be okay. As I progressed through the school year, they told me I was only able to do like two or three days and I wasn't really happy with that. So I did what everyone would do and I looked out to see what my options were. And I had my dad call down to the high school because I was in school and he was able to set up a meeting with Mr. Bullington for me to see what we could work out to help me get what I wanted for my high school senior year. And so I met with Mr. Bullington the following day, I think. And he laid out my two options for me. My first option was uh, virtual studying through VTVLC. And my other option was the flexible pathways on a co-creation, creating my own learning program and how I wanted to do that. And I thought about it because I wasn't really sure what was gonna fit my needs better. And after I talked about it with my family a lot and I thought that creating my own learning would be a better experience and be more tailored to what I wanted to learn. So I started off with co-creation. And my definition of co-creation is a one-on-one -on -one meeting, teacher and student to discuss what we wanted to learn, how, how I wanted to learn it, and what I would need to do in order to be able to get like, meet the standards. Um, and the textbook definition of co-creation is Co-creating with students is a process by which students collaborate with teachers and design their own learning experiences. So co-creation for me started off fairly heavily relying on Mr. Boynton because it's hard to jump into a role like this without ever doing it before. So the first unit I started off in um, was the Roman Coliseum because I've always thought it was really cool. I wanted to learn more about it. So I kind of threw that idea out to Mr. B and he kind of gave me some like guiding questions and what he thought I would need in order to make a presentation or an essay at the time. We hadn't fully decided. And at this point we discussed about meeting like every Monday morning for about an hour or so. And that's typically what we went through the entire school year. And so he would give me the questions to start off and I do them. And I had like five units this year. And by the fourth unit, I pretty much had laid it all out on my own. Like I would looked back at previous examples that he had given me. And I kind of like taken those as a guide, made my own guiding questions, what I thought I would need. And then I would share them with him to see if he thought they were good, what, they, what else I could add in this like overall revisions. So most weeks for me during the school year, looked like I was working, I would work five days a week. I would meet Mr. Boynton at 8.15, like every Monday. And I was usually out of there by 9.15, 9.30. And we would email back and forth during the week and do revisions or other sort of like meetings if, if I needed them. And I, that was, couldn't have asked for a better senior year. It was fit right to what I needed. Um, I think some of the most like notable things that I learned this year, like outside of like school, like characteristics were like self-control, dependability, and grit. And I chose these three because a lot of this work is all on your own. You're not in a classroom being guided. It was all at home for me. So I think that shows self-control because you have to be able to reliably get your work in on time and not have to rely on somebody else to like push you to do it. And I think that goes the same for the dependability. It's always like kind of on you. And sometimes work is hard, so you have to push through it. And that's why I chose grit. Um, and there's always like ups and downs. There was a little while where I was like moving along pretty slow. And I would ideally wanted to be done by like April or so. 
and that didn't end up happening. I finished up uh, first week of June, I think. So I think it, it was very flexible and fit exactly what I needed. Um, Mr. B, do you have anything to add? <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so, really. I mean, I, I would say that Lucas came to this with a lot of uh, drive already. So that is a fortunate situation. Um, he was able to pick up those reins and really run with that sort of co-creation model and start to kind of drive his own bus um, after, you know, as he said, about, you know, three, four projects in. Um, and that was a big deal, right? And that was really important. So I think, like, this was one of the more successful uh, the most successful purely academic uh, flexible pathway that we did this year. Um, and that has as much to do with Lucas as it does with me or, or any other adult in the building. Thank you. And I, I ran off to the restroom. Did you mention you created your own business? In, yeah. I did you not didn't highlight that? that. No. I do think that it would be great for the board to hear. Um, like you created your own LLC. You had a mentor. Yep. Yeah. Um, I created my own LLC. LLC almost a year ago now in July. And I've been working full time in carpentry with, under a mentor and just doing what I love. I think I chose to go, I wanted to be out in the field to learn construction. because I think you can learn a lot in the classroom and like at Randolph Technical Career Center, but I think you can learn more in the field personally. Sounds good. Yeah. Way to go. Thank you. I mean, we didn't. Uh, go ahead, Michael. Is it okay to ask a couple of questions right now? Yes, definitely. <laughs> um, Lucas, I'm I'm just curious that I have a, well, I have a bunch of questions because I'm really um, interested in this whole arena. So um, one of my questions for you, and, and it would go for both of you, you know, both students is. What do we need to do as, as adults to better prepare your peers? When you think about your peer group, how do we better prepare them to be able to take advantage of this program? Because I think, um, you know, I think it was just stated that you were, you were pretty ready for this in some ways, right? To take advantage of reaching out to an adult and working on your own. So do you have suggestions for us to think about as we try to imagine more students getting involved? Um, I think that's kind of a hard question because you, it needs to target like a specific group of students. I don't think you can really just choose anyone. Um, I, I'll be honest. Until my dad called the school, I had no idea this existed. Right. So I think a little, like, publicize it a little bit more would be a way to start, because I feel like the students who would take advantage of this um, class don't necessarily know about it. And if they knew about it, they would go to it. I feel like if they if they actually wanted to be in it. I'd also add get it out to the parents um, as well as the students because that is a really important thing. Because if the parents know, the parents sometimes know their kids better than the kids know themselves. So if they know their kids and know maybe the traditional learning in the classroom doesn't work or online learning doesn't work and there's this other option and they're like oh maybe this might work if i reach out to the school and talk to mr boyington then that might be a really good option for my student and that's something that we can put in place at the beginning of the year and then you don't end up like somebody like me who's part way through the year worrying like oh crap i have to get a history credited how am i supposed to do this um so especially for seniors, when you have that a credit that you have to get in that doesn't necessarily fit into your daytime schedule, um, getting that information out, but also really even pushing it uh, to freshmen as well. So like it's an opportunity for them. Um, I think that's really important. I mean, I know I had an amazing experience uh, with the flexible pathways option. So were you two able to present to your peers at all with what you did or not no i no. know but i think that would be epic especially once you see what i did <laughs> um are you two willing to have your work presented to students in the future yeah yes, definitely. definitely yeah okay because i i agree with you they, they need to be able to see what this looks like to get a handle on it so all right i'll stop there i got a whole bunch more but thank you very much thank you 
right. Uh, I guess I'm next. <laughs> so I'm Maria Gray. I just graduated uh, same class as Lucas. Um, and I had a very a few different things that I needed to target with flexible pathways. So I needed a history credit uh, because I learned that online classes do not work for me. Um, I just couldn't find the interest in it. It wasn't something that motivated me. So I'm just like, all right, this isn't working. Mr. Boyington, what can I do? And that wasn't until I was about halfway through the year. Um, future, that's why I really pushed getting it out there at the beginning of the school year. I do not advise trying to cram a credit's worth of history into a uh, half a year. Uh, I have some interesting background with uh, reenacting, so I managed to make it work because uh, I reenact Revolutionary War uh, as well as Civil War uh, Calvary, so some pretty interesting things. But I came to Mr. Boynton around October, November, um, and I had met a person through um, reenacting who knew another person who happens to be a master gunsmith. And I'm just like, you know what? I want to try this and I want to see if I can build a gun from scratch, 18th century flintlock. And I'm just like, yo, Mr. Boynton, what, what, what can I get with this? What credit can I get with this? How can I tie this into school and figure out that this project that I'm going to undertake will end up being something that will further my high school education? Um, and he's like, well, Let's kind of see how it goes and you'll do it and we'll supplement some other stuff as well which i'll talk about in a little bit um but i had the privilege to apprentice under this amazing gunsmith um and it turned into so much more than i actually thought it would aside from just the um flexibles pathway part um i am currently actually working as his paid apprentice this summer which is way way beyond what i even thought back in november october when i first met him would happen. Um, do you want to hit the next slide? So I, because I was told to show pictures, uh, because pictures are awesome, uh, I started out with just a lock and barrel and a piece of wood. Um, those are pictures of the uh, barrel. There were some few changes that I had to do and had to do to it as well. Uh, next slide. But just so you get an idea, I really did start with just a block of wood. Uh, sawed it down, everything, using as many hand tools um, and historically accurate 18th century tools as I could to really um, learn the craft of gunsmithing the way it was learned and taught in the 18th century at the time of the um, American Revolution. Because that was really something I wanted to get out of this project. Um, I learned just so, so, so many absolutely invaluable hand skills um, filing, those are all examples of filing various t things that need to be filing while building this piece. Next slide. Welding. I learned that I loved welding. Um, it's really, really fun. Uh, settling torch welding, um, as well as I did venture a little bit into electric and gas welding as well. Um, that, I was told, demands its own slide. Um, that is what I called uh, learning how to beat things. Um, I was a little nervous about whacking metal and I was just like little tiny little taps with the hammer and when you're building an 18th century flintlock that does not work you got to really beat the snot out of it so um, my the master I worked under managed to capture a picture of it at the time which is something I still find quite amusing and as you can see I am in a full 18th century kit I rarely did that in the shop but I did for that weekend because I uh, wanted to break in my apron and make it look more dirty, and I definitely, definitely worked, but... <laughs> uh, I learned how to chisel and inlet barrels, uh, ramrods, locks, so many different things. Um, I really went from knowing next to nothing about hand tools. I mean, I could run a bandsaw, I could run a handsaw, a chainsaw, that stuff, but not none of this fine, um, really craftsmanship that was required for this project. And that was definitely a barrier that had to be overcome. Uh, rasping wood, as you can tell, I'm not just bandsawing all of this out. Um, this was hand sawn out with a hacksaw and then rasped away, filed away, chiseled away. And you can really start to see it coming together there. More, I had to learn how to carve things. I can tell you I was absolutely terrified about carving at first um, because 
uh, you can you can't put wood back once you <laughs> once you chisel it out, it's out of there, and you can't mess it up. <laughs> so there was a lot of pressure under that. Next, that's more of the fine carving that I had to do. I had to carve a it's called a rococo shell on the piece of wood there on the stock. That's once the carving's almost completely done. Uh, that uh, wrist escutcheon there was probably one of my favorite parts of the project. That is fine silver. Uh, so I carved that out of wood first and then made a delft clay mold, put it in the mold, and then you melt silver to about uh, 1800 degrees until it's completely like liquid and you pour it into the mold and it comes out like that and you engraved it, engrave it and sculpt it afterwards and then inlet it into the stock. But I love just all of the entire project, every single step of the way. I couldn't, I can't really say there wasn't a step that I absolutely hated. Um, it was all very, very interesting. Um, this you can tell is obviously not um, 18th century tool, but um, <laughs> we had to make some, um, some things work because we didn't have a hand pedal and uh, lathe like they did back then but I turned the ramrod down on the lathe as well as the buffalo horn tip, which you, is the uh, picture on the right. Uh, so this is, these are some interesting pictures of my progress. Um, I learned that looking through pictures, I have about 300 pictures of this entire project. I did not have a picture of the entire piece of wood before I actually, uh, actually did like anything to it when it was just a block of wood. Um, but it's just interesting to see how it progresses and gets closer and closer to the real thing. So that's as it progresses further and further and further. Uh, top left picture, and then it's down to the uh, bottom left picture, and then you scoot over to the bottom right. That was when we had that heavy snowstorm back in the back in March, and I was I saw it propped up on the bench inside, and like I got to see what this looks like outside, so I like a true Vermonter, stomped out there in knee foot deep snow, <laughs> sighting down the barrel just to see what it looks like. Um, and then that's after, the other two pictures are after staining it. And next. And these are the finished pictures of the finished product after uh, I think a total of 300 hours of work, probably 400 counting research. Nice job. Beautiful, yeah. Nice work. There's more pictures, I believe, so. <laughs> wow. I did not do the engraving. I cannot take credit for doing the engraving. The um, master gunsmith I was working under did the engraving. I simply, with the deadline I have to get it done before the end of the school year, did not have the time to learn the uh, skill of engraving. I mean, it's something that these gunsmiths in the 18th century worked on forever. Um, so that uh, that particular slide right there is quite profound, to me at least. That middle picture is my English Valor, and then the other two are two original English Valors. Um, the top oh, wow. one, I can't really quite see. Oh, the top, okay, the top one is from about uh, 1770, and the one, the bottom one is from 1760. Um, and I had a huge compliment from a world, absolutely world-class gunsmith. Um, who said that if I were to just rust up the barrel and rust all the metal up a little bit and maybe beat the wood on the ground and get some scratches on it, that I could actually put it behind glass at Fort Ticonderoga, which was my goal the entire time. I wanted to make a as historically accurate as possible representation of the true craftsmanship of the 18th century. And something that I loved. Uh, these are from when I first got to actually shoot it. Uh, amazing experience, actually. Um, it, it, I learned that it does have quite a bit of recoil. Uh, it weighs a total of uh, five and a quarter pounds. I just uh, re-weighed uh, it today, actually, while I was at the shop. Uh, so it has a super light barrel, meaning it has quite a bit of kick. But it's beyond anything that I ever thought it would ever look like at the very beginning, because I'm just like, I'm never going to actually be able to accomplish this. I doubted myself. Um, but I had Mr. Boynton and Mr. Thomas and Mr. Clayton, as well as my entire family behind me, like saying, like, yeah, you can do this. You got this. And I think I think I even surpassed their expectations of the project. Um, and it's something I definitely never, ever going to forget. Um, as far as the other and that's it for the slides, that's the other stuff. Um, as far as the other part of the history credit, 
um, goes to, because I still had to get that extra history credit. Um, kind of like what Lucas said of like sitting down and talking to Mr. Boynton. Um, we had quite a few um, meetings of, well, what's your knowledge already? Because, and that's because of my background with reenacting, I know a lot about history. Um, and I've always been a history nerd. I think I read every history book I can get my hands on, um, as well as I love uh, diving deep into primary source documentation and finding primary sources of the time period that I'm interested in, whatever it may be. Um, so we had a lot of conversations of, what do you know? Um, what are those, what things do you know that meet the standards? Um, and what other supplemental things do you need to still know? And through that, it was a lot of um, talking, figuring out things out, what would work, uh, writing a few papers, procrastinating writing a few papers, um, procrastinating some more about writing some few papers until it's about a probably five weeks until the uh, senior grades close. And Mr. Boynton's like, Maria, <laughs> you got to get your crap together. Um, and I managed to get my crap together. Um, I, that's why I really think it's really important to start at the beginning of the year. Um, I do not recommend uh, getting your final project done for history the day before graduation. Um, so don't, don't do that. Uh, really, that's why I really push to get it started at the beginning of the year as much as possible. It wouldn't have been as much crammed in and it probably would have been more enjoyable, the actual history writing part of it as well. Great job. I, Mr. Canary, I did come directly from the shop, so my Fowler is currently sitting in the car. You cannot bring it. I cannot bring it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not technically school property, yeah. so. <laughs> we appreciate all that. <laughs> Maria, how accurate is it when you shoot it? Um, so I actually haven't cited it in yet because uh, it's only been done for about three weeks. Um, it should be accurate in a uh, five inch group like five inch grouping around like a uh, bullseye up to 85 yards um, but it has not yet been sighted in uh, you don't cite it you don't touch the site until you've shot at least 100 rounds what do your friends think of this project um a lot of my friends don't really know um or they don't really understand like how much really went into it or how much work really went into it and yeah. i also finished it so late in the school year that a lot of people actually haven't had a chance to actually see it. And have you shared that slideshow with anyone? In other words, if, if the school wanted to be able to access that, is that something you might grant them permission to, uh, to show parts of in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I still definitely need this and I'll be tweaking it as it goes. So I might just make a copy of, this presentation and I can share that. Um, I've actually been asked to um, do a more in-depth presentation of this because I did not go into the history at all with you guys, um, but going into the history at um, historic battlefield sites, I was asked to do it at um, Fort Ticonderoga, Hubberton, and Saratoga by the um, historians there. So, I mean, that's another huge privilege as an 18 year old getting asked to do things. Um, that people have been doing for their entire lives. So. Yep. Awesome. Videotape it, okay? Yeah. For yourself. Yeah. It's great. Nice job. Really good job. Thank you. Wow. That is one of the wow. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> exciting. And a really cool project to get to do. I mean, that's it's, cool. I, yeah. <laughs> it's even more beautiful in person. Yeah. It's even more beautiful in person. Yeah, it's even more beautiful in person. I don't know if anyone wants to step out to the parking lot. <laughs> Probably shouldn't say that again. <laughs> but I want to—I—I I, I said I wasn't going to say anything, but I'm going to step back in for a second because, first of all, I mean, these two young people just astound me. So my heart is full. Um, but you know, the other thing is, like, I want to drop this sort of awareness of what flexible pathways can be and where people get learning. So Maria, you know, we had a lot of conversations mm -hmm. around history, uh, history in the United States, um, and particularly that time period, but beyond that as well. But one of the things I thought was really interesting that I think is worth saying out loud here is that this reenactment um, engagement that she's involved in, is, it's astounding. And what she has learned about, and, and I'm going to say probably not just you, but you, you absorb very well, um, 
but what she has learned from hanging out with those people, you know, who are very erudite, uh, the leaders of the captain and the commander, you know, very, very learned people, um, but just talking, sitting around the campfire after they set up for a reenactment, and it's the night before, and they just sit around, they talk about history. And I mean, it's like, yeah, it's, I, it blows I, it's my like, mind what you know, it's like, what like, you got from that. It's kind of funny because I think reenactments really get a really bad rep, uh, mainly thanks to the SCA, so like middle age Ren Fairs and stuff. But um, if you're really with a good regiment, like Warner's regiment in particular, um, the um, campfire discussion, it, I mean, it's like college level. And there's all these guys talking about debates, picking apart battles, but even picking apart like the, the mindset of the men at the time while you're fighting um, in the war as well. And I mean, it does dissolve into silliness. We have um, one commander who rants for about four hours about the Beatles, um, but then um, you get him on the right subject and he'll talk for hours about the Revolutionary War. I mean, he's actually now a published author. If anyone is interested in World War II and the 10th Mountain Division, um, he has an amazing, amazing book. I definitely recommend um, Heroes in Good Company by Skylar Bailey absolutely well written, very well researched, um, but it's just the quality of their education and their pursual of, it, pursual and passion of the time period and their knowledge of it has expanded my own um, and expanded my own interest as well. So I think it's, I think it's really interesting to see the Lucas and Maria in the same meeting um, because Lucas had to do with the old the, the, the more standard fashion of read things and and uh, you know kind of go through that research process and Maria got to sit at the feet of people who are next to people who are <laughs> talking and and have that knowledge already which are both really valid ways to to learn right um, not everyone could do what either one of them did right those models that's flexible right so those models don't work for every student just like the classroom doesn't work for every student um, if we had switched places for them I'm not sure it would have worked the same way Right, no, I just I don't for me. <laughs> know what they're learning, you know, learning styles and their approaches and their kind of ease of, of uh, learning. But regardless, like, I get to be proud. So that's that's my excitement. Is I get to be proud. Um, so thank you. Thank you, guys. Sarah, I would just like to say that both of you, the students, have a really uh, very good way of presenting uh, themselves and their information. Your uh, your voice and and your ability to be clear in what you're presenting is really uh, you do a very good job at that and I just wanted to give you that feedback. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's I was actually a uh, terrified of public speaking um, and when I did the presentation at school it was a little terrifying. Um, but. Well, you did a really good job. Neither one of you had ums, ums, ums throughout, and you you were, I, I thought you did an excellent job. I used to coach people on that, so I just, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else got questions? Um, just a follow-up piece of feedback. I think that uh, your, the the kind of polar opposite approaches of your projects and subject matter of your approaches really kind of exemplifies the beauty of flexible pathways and the success that we've seen. Like there's true flexibility in being able to like pull the string into your own um, kind of modes of learning. And so I was really pleased to see two wildly different approaches to the programming. Um, so congratulations to both of you and to uh, the adults involved as well. Uh, I certainly was not apprised of like how deep this program goes and um, it sounds like it's really working out for you guys. So that's great. Thank you. Um, one just quick question I had was, uh, what would you estimate the time commitment was for this project compared to a regular class? It certainly seemed like it was more, but. Uh, is that more in Which one, yet? yeah. Well, yeah, I guess each, I mean, it kind of. Um, I would say for me, it, it's not necessarily much different than normal school because I'm not in the classroom every day. It's just at home learning. And I think those are very different things because in the classroom, I feel like you pick up way less than you do like just at home if you're working at your own pace most days. 
Um, I would say I probably spent an hour to an hour and a half, like roughly each night working on it. But like some nights I didn't do work, some nights I did a little bit more. It really fluctuated, but I would say usually about an hour and a half. Um, well, as far as my English scholar goes, um, I think, again, if I had known more at the beginning of the year that I was definitely going through with this project and that I could have gotten out of school early to do this project and could have had my schedule arranged so I could do so, um, it would have been a lot easier. Um, the way I had to do it definitely was not easy. Um, I spent, and I had to do a lot of finagling and arguing with teachers and um, talking to uh, the principal and getting him to back me up on this. Um, I left on Tuesdays around, uh, I think, 11 or hope earlier if I could manage it um, to go to the shop. And then every weekend I spent at least one day at the shop. Um, but if I could have managed it so my schedule could be arranged because I only had um, four classes throughout the day. And if I could have had all those four classes in the morning and then leave my afternoons free to go to the shop, um, it would have been a lot easier. So I, that's definitely something I would advise for students who want to do a flexible pathways that requires them to leave school campus. Um, that's also something I advise for underclassmen who can't leave campus, if that's something that can be figured out, that, that flexibility in there that they can leave campus or even get help transportation, because that was a big thing for me um, as well. But, uh, and then the actual history part, the writing part, um, again, I did it a lot differently than um, Lucas did, and I wish I hadn't, but a lot of that was um, procrastinating on my part, and I can say that that's, that's my fault. Um, I think I crammed at the end of the school year in probably about Normally I pulled out the papers and I'd get them done in like two nights and probably about like five hours each night. I do not recommend that. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> um, so that's not definitely something that... Um, Remember that as you go off to college. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and another thing I forgot to mention actually, because um, this was figured out way at the beginning of the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I got half a credit, uh, half a gym credit um, for the reenacting that I do. Half, oh, sorry, half a physical education credit uh, for the reenacting I do. And I, we managed to figure it out that all the reenacting I do and everything I do at reenactments from charging up hills with, up hills with about like 30 pounds worth of gear actually equated to a physical education half credit at least. Um, so that was something that was easily figured out. But uh, yeah. And I, 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 um... I know this question wasn't asked, but I think that since uh, Maria has brought up some other names, I think we should recognize, I should recognize the other adults who were pretty instrumental in all of this. Um, obviously, Mr. Thomas, our principal, did was very, very supportive all along, mm -hmm. helped out in a lot of ways. Uh, Maria did not talk about the week-long uh, oh young, young Gun Builders yeah. workshop that she went to in Ohio, uh, which the school helped with uh, financing. She yeah. had scholarships, but the school helped get her there. Uh, that would bring in Mr. Jeffrey Clayton, our community-based learning coordinator, who did a lot of uh, time and a lot of work. And Maria also had many, many meetings with uh, with Mr. Clayton. Mm -hmm. um, takes a village, as they say. And I would not want to forget uh, Mr. Christopher Kate, our school counselor, who's played a big role with all of the Flexible Pathways work, um, and particularly with these two young people as well. So I think we, we need to name those folks. Um, of course, Mr. Carney has been very supportive of this from the beginning um, in, in, in pushing forward all the options that we can possibly do so thank you to all those people um, for their help as well it's not it's, it's it's not it's not I can't do it alone I don't do it alone they don't do it alone right so uh, we have all those folks and I'm glad the board's been so excited and, and supportive to, to hear about this stuff so thank you and I forgot to add actually or which can add I learned so much more than just history or just like Jim on this I mean uh, something I forgot to mention is I wrote a grant, actually, and Mr. Boynton and Mr. Clayton helped me write this grant um, to get the parts for this um, English file that I made. Uh, so I learned grant writing. I learned that, oh, if you write well enough, you actually get the grant. Um, and then I learned how to write a scholarship that I swore I was never going to get to go to a workshop out in Ohio and work under two world-class gunsmiths, which was an absolutely amazing experience. And then I learned, oh, when you write well and you have people who know how to write well and they help you write well, then you get a scholarship and you go on an amazing trip. And then 
if you have if you have two people who are really pushing you and they uh, how are like go to, go talk to Mr. Thomas about this or go talk to Mr. Clayton go talk to Mr. Canardi and advocate for getting um, airfare to go to Ohio um, and then I'm like no 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 I don't want to do it I don't want to ask that much of anyone um, and everyone really pushed me like speak up for yourself this is something that maybe you can figure out you never know um, and really this whole um, experience boosted my confidence but it also taught me to speak up for myself and um, know that when you ask and when you reach out to people and ask for help or ask just like, yo, do you have any idea how this might work that you end up going places, I guess, so. <laughs> I think that's like an important sidebar. I would say I learned way more this year than I've ever learned previously yeah. in school. Definitely. Because it's like, I've, I'm always a believer in you learn better when you actually are engaged in the topic standard school they kind of like force it on you where in this i was able to choose what i wanted to learn and being more engaged you re like receive more information better that's because we never um we never actually said what your work was can you, can you tell them what you said so i started off with the roman coliseum i kind of wanted to learn more about rome and then i kind of like wanted to stay in rome so i went to like roman war and tactics and technology so I wrote a paper on the war or on like kind of like the broad army and how it all worked and then like different um technologies and tactics and i made an infographic and then after that i kind of stuck to the tactics and technologies and wars and i went to world war one and then i did um uh, research on the ukraine russia war that's happening right now because i was very present and i kind of wanted to be able to like see how technology had like evolved through time, which it has evolved a lot, but they all still have the exact same purpose, <laughs> pur purpose pretty much, just at a larger scale. Nice. Thanks guys. Yeah, thank I really you. Really appreciate you coming. I definitely advise pushing this program. I mean, Mr. Boynton's kind of humble about it and might push it a little bit uh, at like uh, school meeting, class meetings or whatever, like whole school, high school meetings. He might like say, hey guys, look at this. But it's really something that should be pushed because it goes so far beyond just normal classroom settings um, because normal classroom setting doesn't work for everyone. Um, and really being able to tailor what you want to learn can and has meant everything to me um and it really helps it also really as a senior helps focus helps me focus at least i can't speak for other people on what i want to do going forward with my life and my career choice and my degree choice um and i think those are really important things in high school to really develop as well as developing that self-confidence self-advocacy um as well as just the knowledge base that you're building at a pace that you're comfortable with but also something that well you gotta maybe sometimes you gotta buckle down and do it even if you don't want to um, but it can mean a kid sitting struggling in a classroom struggling how to learn something maybe because maybe it's something they're not interested in so they're bored they're not invested in what they're learning between that and a student really speaking up for themselves saying this is what i want to learn i help me do this please this is what i'm interested in and I want to do something with it to learn more because I know this opportunity now exists and it's something that kids should really take advantage of. I think with that though, we should also be careful who we offer it to because, there um, to yeah, there's definitely kids that would think this is like a walk in the park and they it's just like <laughs> show up and they like not do a lot of work. So as much as I think we should try to give it to everyone, I think we should also target who we choose and shouldn't allow everyone to have access to it unless they have proven they're capable of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's mm -hmm. definitely not something that can just be like undertaken for somebody who's like, I just don't really want to sit in a classroom and I just want easy credit. I mean, I could speak to any student and say, it's not going to be an easy credit, <laughs> but that definitely push for it nonetheless, either way. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.
right? That's a good idea. You can stay and hang out for our meeting if you want. <laughs> We're pretty exciting here. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, guys, we're back to 4.2 on our agenda. Elect a vice chairperson. Do I have any nominations? No, I'll nominate Sarah Root. <laughs> Do I have a second? A second. Any other nominations? Right. Hearing none, all those in favor of Sarah Root for vice chair, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, Sarah, you're the vice Thank chair. Thank you. <laughs> Elect a clerk. I have a nomination for the clerk. I nominate <laughs> Stacy Peters. No, thank you. I'm only an alternate on this committee. So, uh, who's your clerk now? Siobhan Neal. Oh, I don't know who your clerk is now. <laughs> Let me. Our clerk was Maggie, I think. No, it was not. Uh, it was. Um, Edie nominated Hooker for clerk. Maggie. Yeah. She's not on the board anymore. She's not on the full board. No. Well, we need a clerk, guys. I nominate Sylvia Moore. <laughs> <laughs> Sylvia does a great job. <laughs> I'll second that. Any other nominations? All right. Hearing no other nominations, all those in favor of Sylvia for clerk, say aye. 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 Any nays? All right. Yay. Thank you, Sylvia. Because they asked you, Sylvia. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sylvia does a great job. Uh, appoint a recording secretary. So we've been using Parker, I believe. I nominate Parker. <laughs> I'm down for that. Second. All right. So, so that's an appointment. We don't have to vote for that. Nope. Um, appoint one member for signing AP and payroll. Right now, I think it's currently Rodney and I. That's uh, correct. Yes, I'm the ultimate. Either that or it hasn't been signed in a year. <laughs> 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 well, Rodney, you would be hearing from me if you were the one that needed to sign. I get in trouble every now and then, but, <laughs> but not too bad in trouble because they don't have to get you yet. <laughs> I am happy to continue signing. I have a pretty good system down from my office right over the internet. So unless somebody else is interested, then I'm happy to. Else, the fun. If it's working, do it. I had say, keep it going. Are you have to do the alternate? Still? Yeah, yeah, I can be. I do the. You do that, right? Not that it's like that. Now right. you can do it electronically. It's pretty nice. Right, it's nice. <laughs> All right, so Rodney is. I'll do. I'll, Rodney, I'll be the signing member, and Rodney will be alternate. Um, designate newspaper radio station for official notices. We have the Valley News, the Herald, and Great Eastern Radio. That work for everybody? Yep. Okay. Set date, time, and location of regular board meetings. Um, In the fourth Tuesday of the month at six. Anybody have issues with that? Okay, so I say we keep it the fourth Tuesday. And here is what we've said. And here. I think we keep it here too, it seems. Um, and designate posting places. So we had all the town clerks, all of our schools, and that would meet our requirements. So 
that we've had in the past for a full board. Does that work for everybody still? If anybody has an objection or wants to change something, let me know. Not uh, we'll keep it the same. Seemed to work very well this last year. Um, approve the okay. So that is it for reorg. Um, approve the minutes of Tuesday, May twenty third. It was a regular full board meeting. So moved. Can I have a second. That wasn't. Do I have a second for the minutes? I'll second. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, so move. Um, board correspondence and communication with Terry getting something. Is there any renewal notice for a BizBit for our insurance program? Um, you can just say what, the, what it was for time. Um, so the renewal information for BizBit, the annual multi-line contribution, that's the number I need to give, is 313,671. That's down, 18, down $8,776 from last year. That was the correspondence Jared gave me. Are there any public comments? Do we have any public comments? Okay. Are you just a celebration of learning? And we are on to reports to the board. Hey. Uh, so good evening. You have my report in hand. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about electric buses here later tonight. Here, and I can give a more formal update then. I did mention that in my report. Um, I just, I wanted to highlight, um, and I, and I, when I was reading through other administrators reports prior, uh, to going in packets, just, uh, the fact that schools don't really close, uh, that we are open for business. And so I, I think I just wanted to highlight to the board that, um, just how proud I am of all the work we have happening over the summer. Um, you know, I've always think that school organizations are like huge tankers, uh, that are really hard to, to move, right? The trajectory of the tanker. And I think the work that you do in the summer uh, to set yourself up for the next school year is critical uh, for organizations that are focused on continuous improvement. So I just wanted to highlight and remind the board that we have a lot of work happening over the summer. Um, I know we're not, we are not having board meetings in July. It does not mean that we are not all working. Uh, throughout the month of July on focusing on what the work is ahead. Uh, school teams are going to be meeting in leadership teams uh, to focus on how does what are going to be the actionable tasks within their school improvement plan that align to the strategic plan. So the strategic plan articulates a roadmap forward. Uh, the focus now is how does that work then come out and happen at the school level? Uh, and so school-based leadership teams are going to be meeting to do that work uh, over the summer as they're planning things like faculty meetings, in-services, um, early release time for the year ahead. Um, and then I, I created a, uh, I put a document that's linked in there. If you haven't had a chance to look at it, I strongly encourage you to because you hear us talk a lot about data teams and leadership teams or intensive teams. And that document really speaks out around what are these teams and what is the role of these teams within our framework. Um, and so I did embed that document in there. I encourage you to give it a look. Um, and then I'll entertain any questions folks may have. Um, it, uh, it's been, it was a, I, I would have the opportunity to do some reflection with our admin team uh, last week on Wednesday afternoon during our admin team meeting. Uh, there is so much as an organization, I think that we, we should be incredibly proud of um, at multiple levels, both instructionally, when I look at the gains that we've made in mathematics across the supervisory union, the work that we've done to lay the groundwork for uh, in making certain that we're um, addressing the science of reading uh, in regards to phonemic awareness and phonics and changing our approach to lead, uh, literacy instruction. 
Many of you have had celebrations of learning at your district board meeting level around that work. Uh, we're going to be showcasing those celebrations of learning to the full board in August. So you can get a sense that we are all engaging in that work and we have similar tools that we're using. Um, but those tools have been chosen by teachers. Um, and I wanted to just give a compliment to uh, Onda Adams and the work that's happening at the curriculum department around giving teachers that voice to choose. If we want teachers to implement with fidelity, then they should have a voice in what they're implementing. Um, and then also, I'm really excited about the rollout that we're going to have to you coming soon around our revised curricular documents. Um, I think that you're going to see that they are uh, forward, I mean, forward facing and usable by multiple stakeholders, which is what we've been uh, looking to have happen. And so these are a few things that I just mentioned that have all taken place really over the last year and a half. Um, and also, the fact that we have over $6 million of, of capital improvements happening across the supervisory union uh, right now um, around replacing three uh, failed boiler systems, uh, HVAC, and then lighting across all of our schools. So there's a lot of exciting things happening uh, that when you step back and say and look at it and reflect on it, uh, I said to the admin team, no wonder we'll retire. Um, and so I think it's good that we're recharging. And from folks that I've spoken to at the Best Institute, um, it feels like our educators are doing some really great work there this week. Uh, and we have over 45 educators engaging in, in work around their social emotional systems. Every school is represented at Best. And I would tell you that we are, unless Honda corrects me on our neck, because they're there, my sense is we ha are certainly the largest organization at the Best Institute. Uh, we across are, the state. We're over 17. Yes, we are. And that includes the entire state. So mm -hmm. it may even be that. Yeah. Awesome. So there's a lot happening. <laughs> and I'll entertain any questions folks may have. Jamie, I don't have a question, but I, I have a comment, and, and it's around the um, your comments early on in your thing around the continuous learning and. When we had the celebration of learning at, at our school board meeting in Stratford a, a week ago, I guess it was maybe a little bit longer than that, it, uh, which was the primary level uh, teachers uh, presenting their uh, uh, reading and uh, reading and writing um, cr uh, program, and I love that they were so engaged, that they were so excited by it and that they were learning from each other. And I sort of reflected back on, uh, you know, when I was a teacher and, and the information that they're getting and the opportunities they're getting to, to work together and to learn together were things that I didn't really have when I was um, in the classroom. And so I just think it's so powerful. And I just really appreciate your pushing that um, and you and Anda both are doing an absolutely outstanding job, at least Newton. I, I couldn't be happier with that. So thank you. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Thank you, Jamie. I probably took something better. Um, Jamie, Jamie, it's Michael. Could I ask you a quick question? Absolutely. Um, you know, the, the celebration of learning, just to pick up on Sarah, is the, my favorite part of um, any board meeting. And... You know, it's really interesting how diverse those presentations are. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way for us to be able to access or get a sense of what's being shared at other schools. So, you know, like the the field day experience at Sharon, which is not a traditional field day, was an amazing learning experience. But, you know, nobody knows about that. I, I have no idea what was shared at the Newton School and what those teachers are proud of and what they're learning. So, you know, again, there is a tab on the SU website called Celebration of Learning where we're trying to collect all those. OK, great. Um, so and I would be I would welcome feedback on if that's meeting that if you think that that's meeting that or not, Michael. OK, great. I'll take a look. Thank you. Great idea, too, Michael. I like that the idea of knowing what's happening around in, in other schools. And we are on to Honda. I know Jamie's still thunder and all that. I don't have anything else to add. <laughs> no, it's, it's a, um, if you do have the report, you, if you if you had a chance to read it, you see it is we are in the um, in the throes of grant writing season. 
uh, which is, you know, uh, a great time to both be reflective on what ha we have accomplished this year and all that we are trying to accomplish in the coming year. Um, we've already had some success with a, a number of grants coming through um, that were competitive grants around assessments and stronger connections. Um, and so we're, you know, I think grants are, are terrific. They create, they create a little bit more work, but all of that goes into our schools and, and to our teachers and students. So I think they're, um, they're all good. They're all good things. Um, I don't know if I've got anything else to, to necessarily report the, the best Institute. We've just finished up day two and at night, um, with our nine teams over, uh, um, at the Killington, uh, resort there. Um, and it's been really, really powerful. Uh, as someone who doesn't know that many people in Vermont yet, to be able to walk around a room and know most of the people in the room, uh, I see them all the time. It makes it a really, really interesting conference. Um, and we just are having you know, great conversations in teams. Uh, the setup of the conference is that you are in the morning, you're doing learning, that you signed up for strands that extend over the four days. And in the afternoon, they've um, set this up so you really have time as a team to take that learning and put it into practice. So. The, um, the team I'm with, we had, I don't know, eight different activities to finish this afternoon that will be able to sort of be rolled right out um, to the rest of the staff that's not at the Institute um, and then implemented in the fall. And I think that sort of that model for a conference and not expecting people are going to remember everything and sort of put it together sometime in August and hopefully it's going to get rolled out, I think is really um, is really a, a wonderful way to sort of set this up. And so we have, again, nine teams that are, are working on all those different projects and from an early childhood team to teams representing all of our schools, and so um, it's it's been really it's been really great to to be able to be there um, and support the teams and see what they're um, what they're excited about, what they're reflecting on, what what's working well. Uh, we did have one person make a comment that uh, you know a lot of conferences that are focused on curriculum and instruction get a lot of um, a lot of support from central office and conferences like this that are more focused on social emotional behavior tend not to. And I think we have flipped the script on that mm -hmm. for sure um, <laughs> in terms of, you know, finding that all of this is important for our, our, our students and our, um, our teachers and administrators. So I think having this level of support for it has been um, powerful. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Yes, hi. Uh, ditto to a lot of what um, Jamie and Rhonda have, have said. Um, this one thing that I would like to um, highlight um, in, from my report is that um, throughout this uh, school year, we, um, the special education department, has been part of a lot of monitoring um, of our practices um, and also um, how well we <laughs> how well we do our paperwork. And just something I wanted to highlight, even though we didn't meet, um, you know, the standard, which is 100%, meaning, you know, you can't have any errors um, whatsoever. We went from um, scoring 30% um, my first year um, as, as your director to this year, we scored 80%. So we went up 50%. Um, in, in a, like a year and a half on um, our post-secondary transition plans, um, which is part um, of a, a high school IEP. So it's kind of what, um, what we're doing um, as a team with our student and our families to get them ready to be successful beyond high school. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that even though we're not at the standard yet, but I just think the amount of, of work and effort and teaming that's going um, into producing those those plans and um, and really doing them with fidelity and having success with our students um, is just key. And then just the number of dropouts from you know the last graduating class to this graduating class is just so significant. Um, you know, we were at like 20% um, last year and this year, I think we can actually count it as students as like one or two, you know, which is just such a huge, huge difference. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that, which is something that's been such a success um, this year. And I just have one um, resignation. Um, I have uh, Ann Mills, um, an occupational therapist. Um, for First Branch um, has given her resignation. Her family's moving out of state. 
Um, but I have a possible candidate. Um, I have a conversation with them on Thursday. So hopefully I'll have a replacement soon. <clears throat> Anything for that, guys? <laughs> Congratulations on those numbers. Thanks. This yeah. a big, big number. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. So you all have my report. It outlines everything the business office is working on in July. And then the only thing I wanted to add is after reviewing the AP calendar projection for fiscal year 24, um, I met with Jamie. We're going to adjust it. So any of you for your boards who are the warrant approver, as well as you, Kathy, um, we are going to adjust it and we'll have two AP runs in a row. So the first AP run for fiscal year 24 is going to be July 7th versus July 14th. It does take AP off the same cycle as payroll, but reviewing when checks would be issued on the 14th after boards are they get signed by the warrants for the boards and then checks physically get mailed, that means my July bills aren't really getting out to vendors until nearly the end of July, which is unacceptable and I didn't want all those late charges. So we had to make that adjustment. So be prepared for two in a row. And then other than that, uh, summer food service application has been submitted, um, waiting for final approval on that. And then uh, that credit goes to Misha and Haley for getting that done. And then the food service application for next school year is due in July because we'll be running the program in August. And stay tuned for a lot of correspondence and notices around the need and necessity for the free and reduced applications. We're going to be starting our provision two year over again, our base year. So we will be collecting free and reduced applications again for fiscal year 24. Um, but also that's where they're going to be rolling out the direct reporting for students that qualify for Medicaid. So that's also um, hopefully going to increase our direct certification numbers which ultimately will improve our free and reduced percentages because they drop significantly uh, for the current school year. So those are my big updates. And if there's any questions. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. All right. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> as I bring up my report, um, I would like to mention that uh, in my department, it's uh, POs and renewal season, uh, getting things ordered and ready for the fall. And also, in terms of data management, um, we are wrapping up the end of the year report. And it uh, looks like that will be uh, done early, which is, uh, which is nice and uh, different than my first year <laughs> as I was inheriting. Uh, and so I would entertain any questions here in person or... Online. All right. Thank you, Ray. Sure. And policy committee. Who wants to run with a policy committee? Stacy, you want to? Oh, sure. Uh, the policy committee met just prior to this board, as many of you know. Uh, we did advance uh, two policies out of committee tonight. Those were the um, access control and visitor management policy, as well as fire and emergency preparedness drills policies. So uh, you can look forward to seeing those um, up for reading, or if not action, soon. Uh, Jamie had mentioned that the State Board of Ed was hoping to get those uh, pushed forward fairly quickly. They're, they're fairly standard. Um, we also expressed our support for the Narcan procedures um, that we have put together. There has been further discussion on the Board's Civility Code of Ethics policy. There was um, a little further discussion around some of the additions that were brought forward last time. Um, and I believe Kathy made the great suggestion that those who have um, contributed feedback uh, as this policy has evolved now over several months, uh, maybe free some time to turn up on our August meeting so that we can hopefully get to a point where we're addressing everybody's feedback and um, sort of not revising 
your uh, good comments and thoughts out of those documents as we move it uh, hopefully closer to completion. So that committee meets next, um, right before our August meeting, which is on the 22nd, at August at 5.30, uh, if those of you with continued interest, feedback to that policy that stop in, hopefully we can get to the, the end of the road. There's been some great discussion, but it's still uh, not quite there. Did I miss anything? No, I think that was great. Thank you. You bet. All right. Any questions of the policy committee, guys? All right. All right. Uh, discussion, full board retreat. And I am a bad toad. I did not finish my survey on this. So I was going to give the, uh, so the feedback is that um, we didn't, it, so we had nine people say they could do the eighth, but we now have a different board retreat on the eighth, just so folks know. Um, Stratford, right, Sarah? Is that the eighth? You're muted. Yes, right? Sorry, okay. my, my microphone is off. That's that's our meeting, not our retreat. Our retreat. That's our, your meeting, right. So we I've got a board meeting on the eighth now. Um, and so that that date out. Okay. So we did get seven respondents who said they could do a board retreat on the 22nd, which uh, would have been our policy and full board meeting. Um, my sense is we'll have a quorum. We typically do on our full board nights. <laughs> um, and so I guess we just need to decide, like, do we want to have, like, on the 22nd, maybe do policy and then do a retreat. There's no necessarily business that has to happen on the 22nd. Um, and if there was, we could do that business um, or otherwise we're punting a retreat into September probably because we've got other boards doing retreats. August is fairly full here uh, quickly because FBUD's on the 14th now. These ago, yeah. First branch is on the 14th. I say we try for it on the 22nd. If there's seven that can do it and we're supposed to be here anyway, and then we work the rest of the meeting in with it. Michael, you're, you're on VT. You can't do that. Can't do I mean, I'm, I'm not saying don't do it on the 22nd. I'm just looking at my calendar and I can't. I, can't, I just want you to know I can't make it. I won't be there. Not that that changes anything. <laughs> Don't misunderstand. <laughs> I know Mr. Canarni is weeping right now at the thought out. I won't be in attendance, but. Uh... <laughs> well, we definitely need nine. I mean, ideally we'd like more. But what we found last year was just so that to go back to the board, we found as we put out surveys, we never got to a number that we felt like was a large enough number. And finally the board decided after, I think it was in December or January. Finally, we just said, we're going to warn it and we're going to see what happens. And we ended up getting a decent turnout. So, you know, my sense is at some point we're going to pick a date and roll. It just the question is, is it the 22nd or not? <coughs> I get a thumbs up from the group here on the 22nd. I have a little comment though before that. I think um, the retreat is um, valuable for everybody, but I, my thought is that it's also really valuable for people who are new to the, to the SU board and, and to boards. So um, <coughs> I, I'm one, you know, so I want to say that. <laughs> I think that, that to, to get as many new people as possible would be really important. I agree. Well, I could certainly put out um, that correspondence and emphasize that with mentors and mentees. I could put out an email to those folks, Sarah, to emphasize that. I think that, you know, that, that that's, I mean, I, I think it's valuable to all of us. Um, you know, I'm not trying to minimize the value of it, and I think there's an added bonus for people who are new to, the, to their boards. What, what if we looked at a 
Like, what if we did pick a date tonight in September? I mean, I don't, I don't see a reason why September is off the board. Can everybody just take a look at their calendar that's on here right now for like September 12th? I'm free. Anybody else? Andrew, could you do the 12th? I think so. Works for me. Works right. for Will. Casey? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Rodney? Yeah, I think so. 12th it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 we got to get a date locked. All right. So it looks like we're going to lock the 12th. And for me, could everybody at their regular board meetings please push their other board members to come? This is I mean, it's a full board retreat, but there's a lot of great information, a lot of stuff you can learn from other board members, and it's fun to get to know other board members. I mean, that's the the most fun I had last year was when we were playing like a trivia game, and we just got to know each other and, and talk about things. So um, I think a lot of really great stuff can come out of the retreat, and if you could just put a little peer pressure on your fellow board members to to show up, that would be really appreciated. Have a good board, Royal. What's Kathy? What's the timing going to be? Time, yeah. Um, people think like five thirty. We start at five thirty. We did last time. Five thirty. We'll meet for a little while. We'll have some dinner, and then we'll um, get together. We'll do like an icebreaker, have dinner, and then we'll we'll do some board retreat work. Mission vision's been on the, your board goals, and I do think we need to revisit that. So I thought that, that could be a good. Yeah, that'll be a good topic to work on. All right, so five thirty. Does that sound good to everyone? And if you can't make it right at five thirty, don't feel like you shouldn't come. Like if you like, I uh, can't wait get there till six. I'm at six, have dinner, and then do the rest of the meeting. So just it's okay to come late to that meeting. I'd rather you be on time, but it's okay to come late. <laughs> Maybe can we make sure that um, Christy puts that it's on all of our uh, agendas for our uh, August meeting. Yep. So we'll talk about it. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, electric bus rebate program. So this was in my report. Um, I just in so I had originally said I was going to have Stacy Emerson, the general manager at STA, join us tonight. She's going to join us on the twenty second. Um, she's cleared that in her calendar. She wasn't able to make it tonight. I think that that's okay, anyways, because I think we're going to have a much fuller uh, presentation to be able to provide everyone. So where we're at is we've got uh, Tara and I have done site visits with Green Mountain Power at the uh, Newton School at Sharon and at Stockbridge and the infrastructure is, um, we're gonna be able to do for under a thousand dollars, meaning at the pole infrastructure with transformers at each one of those sites. Uh, now we were awarded $60,000 for infrastructure for level, for charging stations. We're looking to pursue level two after um, Tara and I have met with um, a consultant with the EPA, uh, a level two charging station eight hours with a full-size bus it would be fully charged and then the recommendation would be that you would then plug it back in during the day um, and that we'd be able to get full charges throughout the day at both ends of the routes um, and so we were looking at locations where buses could be parked and not impact traffic flow or parking um, and so at the newton school we're looking at the transformer um, down as you're driving out of the driveway on the left, there's some overflow parking at the bottom there on the left, and there's a pool. That parking, I talked to Tracy, she didn't feel like they necessarily needed that day to day, and that that could work fine for bus. Um, hook up there for 11 to level two charging station. At Sharon, um, Will Davis, our share, oh, he's on our board member and chair at the Sharon. Uh, school board has been in touch with the town of Sharon and I've been in touch with the Sharon Academy about a level two charging station in front of um, the Sharon Academy Middle School where we could hook up a level two charging station there off of that pole. And then Stockbridge already parks their bus right in front of the school, much to um, my sugar, I, I dismay, I don't like it, but 
it's a perfect infrastructure right there. So I'm going to feel better about the bus being in front of the school now. Uh, <laughs> there'll be a level two charging station in front of the school. Uh, and so anyways, the infrastructure looks to be that uh, Tara would go out to RFP around this so we could get uh, bids. The infrastructure looks to be well within budget. And so now the next step that we're taking is uh, Tara and I are working with uh, Student Transportation of America uh, to get our routes in those three towns to uh, the EPA. They're going to help us just to ensure um, that electric two vehicle in the dead of winter, worst case scenario, can complete our routes. That's the next big question that we're looking to get answered. We should have the answer for you in August. STA does have experience with electric buses at the Buried Unified Union School District. So I think that they can answer questions board members may have uh, just around, you know, upkeep. Do you have mechanics to work on them? All those, those types of questions. Are you actually seeing the uh, routes that they project still stay, uh, in fact, accurate years later? I'm probably giving you some of the questions I continue to ask, but I'm assuming you have questions too. Uh, and just so folks know, we did receive an extension into August um, from the EPA with this, with the agreement that as long as we were making progress, that they would extend out another three months uh, before we actually had to, you know, have purchased the vehicles. Um, and so we're still good within our timeline. I do feel like we're making good progress. Um, and Tara, what did I miss? Anything? No, you hit it all. All high points. Um, so any questions folks have, discussion around it, I'd love to hear your guys' feedback. Um, you know, what I would say to you is that we, we, I meet with STA every other Wednesday. It's on our agenda tomorrow. Uh, one of the things we're looking at with these electric buses is to probably pursue purchasing like middle, like 44 passenger buses for those three locations, because that's the capacity that we currently have on our routes now. We operate smaller vehicles um, in those towns. And so that would make the most sense um, in regards to the purchasing uh, for the electric uh, buses. It does not mean within our contract, anytime we need a larger capacity bus, we have those. Um, and so if you're thinking of like, what happens if we have a field trip and 60 kids are going? We always have access to a 60 passenger vehicle if we need it. Will. Yeah, so I mean, that was kind of my question, but just, you know, are those are those routes and those schools that are being served, um, you know, close to already hitting that bus capacity? Like, are we going to, you know, if we grow over the next five years or 10 years? No, okay. No, not based on our projected ridership and what we've had for ridership. Like I said, we already use smaller buses in those towns. It wasn't that we're going to a smaller bus. Yeah. Okay. And then my only other question is, is there, do we have to take out some kind of like bridge loan? Is that how this works? And then get reimbursed after we buy them? It's a rebate program. And depending on where the proposals come in, that will be the next discussion. If we can get the buses and the, the infrastructure that we need within the confines of the rebate, then no, we won't have to get additional funding. But if the bus route, if the buses come in higher than what the rebate is, yes, we will have to look at alternative funding. We don't expect that. I just meant because it's a reimbursement, we have to make the purchase, right? And then get the money. We have to show proof of purchase. So basically I have to show the EPA that the purchase order has been processed and accepted by the builder. We don't have to lay it out. Yeah. Okay. They'll, they will get yeah. it to us. Upon proof of purchase, which is what's our POs. Thanks. Yeah, the, the, other, the question that I had was whether there was any lead time from order to actual delivery. I mean, it seems like everywhere else in the world, if you order a car, you're looking at a year. So I'm just curious as to whether there's any estimate of. We've been to, I've been orders. told eight to 10 months. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on the electric buses, guys? Thank you guys for your work on that. Is there any action? Anything? And there's no public, so no public comment. I would say to the board, as far as action, I'm going to look for you to take action on this 
in August because I think it's a significant decision and it's one that deserves board action. And so we will warn it for possible action. If you're not ready to do it in August, you don't have to do it then. We will need to do it here sometime, I would say October at the latest based on our timeline. So um, you will start to see this warn for action. Um, and when you're ready, then, then you can make that decision. Any resignations from the buyers other than what we're receiving? Any other business? All right, so I need a quick executive session with the board. And then I will set you free. Here for me. Mm, depends on how long you are. It'll be a minute. Yep. Yeah. I will be here. Uh, get a motion. Get a second. Can I get a motion to go into executive session for personnel? Mm -hmm. a motion to go into executive session for personnel issues. Second. Second. Right. So move. Okay, it's recording. Cool. All right. okay. Motion to come out of executive session. So moved. No action taken. With no action taken. Second. Second. And do I have a motion to adjourn for the night? So moved. Second. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.